All right, welcome everyone to tonight's presentation. We are set up in a webinar style mode. So we can see that you're here. Um, video and mic has been disabled for participants, but I'll explain later. We've got a little chat box for questions. So welcome to tonight's presentation about the environmental history of Northport. I'm your host, Samantha Gentrup. I'm a local teacher. I'm also the co-founder of a local grassroots group called Hands Along the Water. Tonight's event is presented by the Environmental Conservancy of Northport. I'll tell you a little bit about them. Uh, they are a 501c3 nonprofit land conservancy. They, they focus on the acquisition of land in Northport and surrounding areas for the purpose of preservation and protection of land and education about uh, the local resources and natural habitats in our area. This includes the threatened gopher tortoise and Florida scrub jay. They launched in February of 2020 and the focus yeah. is on land parcel acquisition in Northport, uh, especially land that hosts an active population of Florida scrub jays. Their ultimate goal is to obtain and conserve vacant parcels in the neighborhoods of the city and surrounding areas. And they want to create a balance between development and the local environment. I am, uh, I agreed to be here tonight because I'm a huge fan of this organization and I believe that land acquisition is extremely, extremely important. So we're excited for you all to be here tonight and meet and learn with our guest presenter, John O. Miller. John O. is a, a natural historian, an environmental educator, and an environmental activist who's worked for over 50 years to understand and protect the wild places in Southwest Florida, including Northport. We're thrilled that you're here with us tonight, Jono. Thank you for uh, agreeing to be a guest and share your knowledge with, with me and the community here. Um, before I hand everything over to Jono, just a, a little housekeeping. This is scheduled to be an hour and a half event tonight. There's a chat box down at the bottom of the screen. So if you're in Zoom here and you go to the bottom bar, there's a chat bubble. And you're welcome to interact by asking questions or you know offering things in that chat area. I'm going to be monitoring that, and then uh, if there's something that's really pertinent to what Jono is talking about, I'll just politely interject and and make sure your questions are heard and and addressed by Jono. And then the last 15 to 20 minutes, we'll have some time for some question and answer for anything that might not have been um, you know answered during the actual presentation. So. With that said, Jono, I am going to pass this on to you. Give me just a second to make you a host here. And that should give you the reins to share your presentation with us. Here we go, uh, bring this up and this. All right, well, thank you, Samantha, um, and thank the Conservancy for hosting these events and for the work you're doing in Northport. Um, I have a couple of uh, points I wanna start with. Um, the first is, this is a work in progress. Um, I, my guess is by the time we're done, the people that have signed on may know more about uh, the environmental history of Northport than I do collectively, but uh, I'm retired and I had a chance to write some of this stuff down. Uh, and the second thing is if any of you are serve on any of the three advisory boards that I serve on, you should probably log off and view the um, view it once it's complete. The Office of the County Attorney here in Sarasota is recommended to avoid any uh, possible sunshine problems to do that. I don't really intend to be talking about future matters that these boards may vote on, but you never know what might come up in questioning. So here's Northport today. Um, and it's one big amalgamation, uh, but it's really composed of pieces. And uh, these pieces were added at different times for different reasons. And 
Uh, we don't have enough time today to talk about the entire Northport. So I'm gonna focus on the original a township and a half uh, that was sort of the starting point. So uh, this square and half square are the first two townships um, that, that were Northport. And if you see that circled 21, that's a range. And you see over at Osprey, it says in 18, 19, 20, 21. So those are the numbers of the townships east of a meridian in Tallahassee. So if you've ever been to Tallahassee, you know there's a meridian road. And um, so uh, the townships are measured both to east and west. So 21 townships east is in this column. And then uh, um, or the ranges are east and then the townships are measured south. And so uh, that the larger square there is township 39 south range 21 east. Now this system was uh, conceived of by Thomas Jefferson it's very elegant in that it allows the federal government to sell land in places no one had seen, but that was also the biggest problem with it because historically, when land was first divided um, in the Eastern United States, they relied on natural features. They went to a ridge line or a river. Um, and so there was some geographic coherence to how land got divided up. But with this system, that's pretty random and things get split up in odd ways. So um, there are 36 square miles in each uh, township and they're uh, surveyed in the order I showed in that little animation because the surveyors get to one end and then come back in the other direction. It doesn't make sense for them to walk all the way back and do it again. Um, so I wanted to talk just a little about where this talk came from. Um, in 1982, GDC contracted with New College to fulfill a requirement of the Mayaka State Settlement. Um, and they said, you know, a, a college would have to work on studying the uh, wildlife of the area. And it was supposed to deal with burning as well. And so that led to a report that I worked on with Gene Huffman and Julie Morris. Maynard Hiss helped us with that. And uh, this was that report. And then uh, subsequently, I went to graduate school and uh, in a geography class, I chose to write about how landscape and layout collided in the design of Northport uh, and how decisions made in the 60s continue to affect the city today. And then I've also relied on Marshall Grove's book, Out of the Wilderness, which uh, was sort of a commemorative uh, publication that talks about the history of Northport. So uh, his Quotes from his book are, are found throughout my presentation. So again, this is Northport. We're gonna be dealing with roughly half of Northport, uh, a section which is 36 square miles, another half section, 18. So that's a total of 54 square miles. And the question we're basically asking is, what was Northport like before it was Northport? So starting with this out of the wilderness book, um, the earliest uh, records we seem to have are surveyor's notes. Um, both for the external township boundaries and then the internal sections. The sections are the individual square miles. Um, and so this is what uh, the survey of one of the townships looked like. This is that big township, uh, township 39 South Range, 21 East. And so the surveyors took notes and uh, some took more and better notes than others and some were more legible than others. So this one, if you look at the right, I've tried to transcribe it. Uh, he was heading south from the northeast corner of section uh, 31. Uh, he went 40 chains or a half mile, and then he set a half mile post. Um, uh, and then further down, 47 chains, he ran into a creek running southwest. Uh, 50 chains, he's, he was across the creek. And then he got to the township line on the, on the corner. So there are pages like this for each of, the, um, each of the sections and for the township as a whole. And so uh, they, as they made these notes, they would write down what kind of land they were passing through. So there, it was common in Northport for people to describe it as third, third rate pine land, third rate prairie land, wet prairie land, um, level poor third rate pine land, 
uh, high saw palmetto, which made, made it really difficult to uh, chain or measure the distance. Uh, level open pine with narrow strips of live oak on edges of pond. So using these surveyor's notes, you can sort of reconstruct uh, looking at the soils and these notes and some aerial photography, you can sort of work backwards to figure out what things must have looked like. Uh, they described a creek called by the Indians Mayakahatchee. And in one place it was 99 feet wide and another place uh, wider. They described again poor, uh, poor third rate pine land full of ponds. In the wet season, the whole country is covered underwater. Um, one large pond in the rainy season. So it was very wet. In the late 1800s, uh, timbering and cattle ranching prevailed. Uh, the Knight family apparently tried to fence off warm mineral springs. Um, and they started the Sugar Bowl drainage district. Um, and that was prior to 1920. So we're talking about the channelization of Big Slough for more than 100 years. So when we look at Big Slough today, it's completely different than what it was look like uh, in 1910, let's say. Uh, it says they started seven miles south of State Road 2072 where a definite natural channel existed. So you see in the light blue there, this was the boundaries of the Sugar Bowl drainage district. Uh, it was situated in the extreme southeast corner of Manatee County and northeast corner of Sarasota County. And this is an old uh, blueprint that I sort of reversed. So this is the upper portion of the drainage district you see on the right. And there's a lot of interesting annotations in here about turpentining and little houses that people had, the names of the sloughs. You see that blue line, that's the, would be the current Northern boundary of uh, Northport. And then further south over on the left, you see big salt springs and then to the uh, northeast of that little salt spring. And, but this is not terribly accurate. If you superimpose this on an aerial photograph, a big slough doesn't really match up very well. So turpentining was another important uh, use of the land. In the 30s, there was a lot of um, timbering uh, uh, in the area. Uh, and Cecil Daughtry, who we interviewed, uh, said that it, uh, the GDC property once belonged to a man named Murdoch. Um, and his secretary married a guy named Frizzell, and he had a sawmill and, and made money in the lumber industry. And then there was the Murphy Act. Uh, Murdoch apparently didn't care that much about the property, and Frizzell started buying it up for taxes under the Murphy Act. So let me explain the Murphy Act. It provided that if taxes were delinquent, anyone could pay two years back taxes and get a quit claim deed. And then if they paid for the next two years, they could get a, a, a better, more valid deed. And so Frizzell was able to acquire most of the land um, between the Peace and the Mayaka River. Uh, eventually included, yeah, all of Charlotte County between the Mayaka Peace Rivers and the Township and a half we're talking about. So this, all this blue area was controlled uh, by this Frizzell gentleman. Now, uh, over to the west on the Cape Hayes Peninsula, he owned another 20,000 acres that the Vanderbilts ended up own, owning. And so if you look at uh, the 1948 aerials of uh, that Township and a half, the original Northport, uh, what you see are a number of sloughs. Now, slough is a term that doesn't get used a lot. It's a non-forested wetland that lacks a defined channel. So these were broad, open, marshy areas. Uh, they would be completely inundated in the wet season. They would dry out somewhat in the dry season, but there were no trees in them, just open, marshy areas without a channel. So this was a habitat map we can constructed um, showing the some of the sloughs and um, I'll talk just a little bit about what we're seeing here so uh, you can see that um, tan colored area of improved pasture that was right next to uh, Little Salt Spring and we'll talk about that later the brownish color on the left um, that was scrubby flatwoods so if you look at those scrubby flatwoods combined with the palmetto prairie to the north sort of in the constitution area that's the area that would have been most likely to support scrub jays uh, historically. The dark green was hammock, you know, cabbage palm and live oak hammock. 
the light blue was um, the sloughs, and then the, the dark, the other color green down at the bottom there, uh, that was wet prairie and, and uh, a wetter system that lacked pine trees. And then over on the eastern side, more sloughs, and uh, again, a little bit of improved pasture, and that, that was actually near the Nona Spring area. So um, to talk about the actual development, uh, the Mackle Brothers um, started General Development Corporation and uh, they bought 80,000 acres for about $45 an acre. And uh, Gary Marmino in his book said they paid two and a half million for 80,000 high and dry acres. Well, the, actually I had to correct Gary, they were not high and dry acres and we'll learn more about that. So it's about 100 and 25 square miles. So here are the Mackles, Robert, Frank, and Elliot. And they were involved in a number of developments uh, on the West Coast, Port Charlotte, Cape Coral, uh, uh, Marco Island. Um, actually, they weren't involved in Cape Coral. Like, I checked that out. But these, so these were other big communities on the West Coast, but they weren't involved in all of those. They were, these are the ones they were involved in on the West Coast, and that's in Hernando County, the Spring Hill development, Northport in Sarasota, Port Charlotte in Charlotte, and Marco down in Collier County. Hey, Jono, can I yes. interrupt you real quick? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, we have a question that came in from John Singer, and yes. um, I, I was trying to find a good time to <laughs> interject okay. here. It's a good question. He says, if the creek was known as the Myakahatchee in the 1840s, how did it get the name Big Slough? Where did that name come from? I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Probably a repudiation of things Indian. You know, people yeah. wanted to. And actually, the other part of that is if you looked at that map, it, it turned out it was the largest, widest slough running through there. So just on a descriptive level, uh, it was fair to call it Big Slough. All right. more, than, more than that, I don't know. Okay, and then a follow up to that is he was looking at that map and he said um, it looked like it might have been dredged in the early 1940s. Yes, and but, I, we will we will get to that. That's a okay. good observation because as you as you recall, the the sugar bowl drainage, which we'll talk about, uh, started in the 20s. So by the time we got to 1940s, it had, it had been dredged quite a while. Um, so originally. The holdings of GDC were one big happy Port Charlotte development. And, uh, but they attempted to plat the portions that lay in Sarasota County and Sarasota County wasn't interested in doing that. Um, they called it Port Charlotte, but it probably really wasn't uh, much of a, a port. And it, uh, up half of it roughly was in Sarasota County. And, <laughs> The idea was that it was going to be a city without taxes. Now, I have to go back and find the citation for that. I, I think people would be amused if, if we can document that they were advertising as a city without taxes. Um, so yes, the city was trying to bypass the subdivision regulations uh, for the portion in Sarasota County. So in 10 days, um, they established residency and uh, 21 voters who were all uh, employees of GDC cast ballots in favor of incorporating as a city. Uh, and it was run by their employees. So they basically controlled everything and it grew rapidly. Um, biggest, one of the biggest little cities in the country and that's still true today. Uh, so their pitch was you could buy a lot for $10 down and $10 a month. And so here's one of their advertisements, you can see some of their developments on the East Coast, and there's Port Charlotte on the West Coast. Um, but they had like you know, nine branch offices. Uh, you could get a free, absolutely free full color roadmap of Florida, which featured their communities. Um, lots are offered for sale, 80, 895 feet by 125 for $699. So the first year they brought in 2.6 million and in 1957 it totaled 15 and a half million. So it, it was a big success. Um, and here's some more of their promotional material. 
uh, again, $10 down, $10 a month. I'll answer all your questions. You get a money back guarantee. If at any time within 30 days, you ask your $10, you'll get it back without question. So there are lots of different forms of development. Historically in cities, they used the gridiron, you know, streets and avenues, they were numbered and people knew if you said you lived at the corner of uh, 85th Street and Fifth Avenue, uh, people could find it. But uh, as time went on in the 50s, they started going to a more fragmented approach than what's called warp parallel loops and lollipops and then lollipops on a stick. And the lollipops were creating um, uh, cul-de-sacs, which people, well, at least they promoted them because uh, there would be less traffic on your cul-de-sac. But of course that increased traffic on the remaining roads. So uh, part of the challenge for GDC was that no part of the Frizzell Ranch was above 30 feet in elevation. And as you'll recall, in a wet season, it was covered with water. So what to do? Um, so the, the slope was only two tenths of an inch and 100 feet, and you had 52 inches of rain a year. So there could be a lot of water flowing over this land. And this is a... Um, image from a PowerPoint, a Northport Watershed Management Plan PowerPoint. You can see the township and a half that we're talking about tonight, but you can see the, the other area, particularly to the east and how, um, how wet it is prior to, uh, prior to drainage. Uh, so they had to form a drainage district in order to uh, be able to drain the land. And these, were, these drainage districts were authorized by the state of Florida. And if you had more than half the acreage, then you could uh, petition to have a drainage district form. Um, and you've got one vote per acre. So if you owned you know, the majority of the land, you controlled what was gonna be going on. Uh, so they created this uh, canal system and they generally followed those sloughs. And what I found interesting was they actually brought drag lines over from the Mississippi that weren't being used there. So they ended up constructing 175 miles of canals. And so uh, the canals then, because there were so few bridges um, going over the canals, the canals sort of ended up defining neighborhoods. So you ended up in a situation where uh, people may live just a few hundred feet apart from each other on either side of canals, but uh, there was no way to get from here to there. And because there was not a grid road system, there was no coherent way for anyone to understand where another address was. Everything had to be looked up. Whoops, let me go back here. Um, so the roadways, uh, instead of elevating the roadways, the roadways were excavated. and um, that had some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, most road builders would tell you you don't want a lot of water in your road base. So the lots were dry, but uh, it, it created other problems. And uh, by, by digging down, they were lowering the water table. So areas that used to flood, now we're staying dry, which meant it increased the potential for fire. And the streets also functions as fire bricks. So previously you'd have one fire and it would, it would just burn as long as there, were few, as there was fuel. But once they put the road system in, a lot of these a lightning strike might only burn one block. And so fire became much less frequent in the area. The, the, there had been frequent low intensity fire which had kept the fuel loads uh, low. And once, they, once the uh, drainage took place and areas were um, divided by the roads as fire breaks, that really increased the higher fuel loads and led some very large catastrophic fires. So this is uh, data from one um, period from 71 on to 83. And you can see how many of the uh, fires were um, arson. There was a, a period when arsonists apparently were moving to Northport <laughs> so they could uh, go out and start fires. They'd start a fire in one place and then while the uh, fire department was busy there they'd drive somewhere else and start a fire. 
There was also um, uh, the rainfall problem they had wasn't just limited to what was going on in the city, but within the entire basin. Um, so in 1978, they said the flooding situation has been further aggravated by intense water management practices on ranches and groves located on higher ground north of the city. So uh, if you look at uh, Big Slough or Mayakahatchee, uh, it goes really far up. In fact, if you were to draw a line to the west, you'd end up out on uh, Lido Beach somewhere. So this is a really big watershed that's flowing down into Northport. And if you look at this, the, the lower portion, the sort of orange tint is uh, Northport. The purplish area above it is land that's protected uh, by uh, either fee or conservation easement. Then there's some red areas uh, that are agricultural at this time. And then the uh, tinted area to the top are phosphate holdings. So what this means is that uh, the city most threatened by um, a, phosphate, a, a phosphate spill in this area as it's developed was Northport. Uh, and you can see again in red, these are sort of the, the wetter portions of the um, basin and, and the little orange square, I believe represented um, maybe orange hammock, I'd have to check on that. So uh, eventually things started to head south for uh, GDC and uh, the criminal charges were filed, although those were later uh, removed. Um, but that's what led to that contract with New College, the settlement. Um, and also a lot of uh, uh, really bad flooding in uh, Northport over the years. And in 1992, that was a, that was a uh, 20 inch in six days. So, uh, a lot, of, a lot of potential for flooding and, and that's apparently now being aggravated by new FEMA maps, which suggest um, a lot more areas are susceptible to flooding. And there's an outfit called First Street, which is creating their own flood maps and projecting 30 years in the future. And those are even more alarming. So uh, what I'd like to do now um, is just sort of take four sort of case histories, looking at different parts of this, this part of the city and try and look at uh, some uh, historic images and sort of figure out what's going on. So uh, we're gonna start down in the South where uh, US 41 dives down into Charlotte County. Uh, so this is Township 39 South, Range 21 East and it's sections 33 and 34. And you may recognize this, there's a racetrack gas station on the corner there and there's a Salford and Cranberry. So this is a you know, pretty intensely developed area. There may be some vacant lots in there, but the majority of it is developed. This is what it looked like uh, in 1948. So if you look, you can see these wetlands, these darker patches. These are wetlands that would have remained wet most of the year. They could dry out in a drought, but generally they were probably wet. And uh, they, as one filled up, it would, um, you know, it would fill up and flow downstream into the next one. And so there are those wetlands. And then in, the, in, the, in between them, it, it was also pretty wet. And this was probably that wet prairie condition where there were very few pine trees. And then uh, there were other areas that were a little drier, again, with very few pine trees. So this was the, um, these were the engineering plans for how GDC was going to connect these wetlands up in order to um, affect the drainage they wanted. So if we go back, you can see where the wetlands are, and then you can see uh, GDC's plans to connect them up. So this is why these uh, canals, instead of being orderly or a grid or some uh, predictable pattern, seem to wiggle all around. It was an effort to connect these lower wetlands up. So this is what it looks like today with the uh, canals. And here, if we superimpose where the low areas were historically. Um, so if you own a house in this general vicinity, I would predict you'd be a little more likely to flood in these pale blue areas than you would in areas that 
have none of the shading. So again, that's what it looks like today. So uh, let's look at another site in, in Mayakahetchee Creek. So this is the Mayakahetchee Creek Environmental Park today. You can see there are a number of trails. There's a yellow trail that runs along the creek. There's a white trail that heads up sort of on the north side. And then uh, um, there's a red trail that comes down near Tropic Hare. So uh, this is kind of interesting. The green is the current boundary of the park. The blue is other land that's owned by uh, Northport for their road and drainage department or whatever it's called. And those sort of mustard colored areas are actually vacant lots with no homes on them that are adjacent to the uh, park. So what we're looking at here, I believe it's the 1948 aerial. And so as we mentioned earlier, uh, this channelization that you see there had probably been in place for close to 30 years at that point. So what we're seeing is uh, some trees starting to creep into what had been the slough. So everything, everything between the sort of tree lines on either side had at one point just been open marshy slough, and then they ran a channel down the center of it, and that dried it out more effectively and trees started to creep in. Uh, this is a little later look. Uh, things have grown up a bit more. Uh, there seems to be some discrepancy in the north there about exactly where the uh, where the line should have been, how it was surveyed. And so, if we go back and superimpose the current boundary over uh, the 1940, you can see that only those red tinted areas, those are the only uplands um, that remain. All, all the trees that you see now when you visit the park with the exception of those red tints uh, have grown up since 1920. Um, and so the, that lower, uh, the, the largest area there is now where the red trail goes. And this is what the palms look like in there. These are some very old cabbage palms. They were visible in the 48 aerials. Um, they probably could have been there 50 years or more prior to that. So they're getting to be some pretty old palms. And again, uh, this is what it looks like with the sort of scattered development around it. Uh, so the uh, next place I want to look at is a Little Salt Spring area. And the uh, surveyors described it as a running rivulet of medicinal water, mildly cathartic, which meant um, sulfur, sulfur water, just as we know uh, both more mineral and salt springs today. So there are other karst features in the area. Um, there's Deep Hole in Mayaka Park. There's a place called Quezon Lake that's in um, Cade of Sawgrass. I don't really know if it's a karst feature, but it seems like it easily could be. Karst relates to uh, limestone uh, sinkholes and collapse features. And uh, there's been some discussion that the horse ponds on the Carlton Reserve uh, may have been flowing at one point, that the reason the horses were kept there is it was a more reliable source of water. I don't know if that's true, but that would be worth checking out. But the, the most, uh, the best known of these karst features are Warm Mineral Springs, Little Salt Spring, and Nona Spring. So uh, this is a section, a map uh, that I showed earlier um, that's kind of inaccurate. Um, you can see what was called Big Salt Springs and then Little Salt Springs, that makes sense. Uh, the, the discharge from Little Salt Springs is not terribly accurate. And as I said earlier, if you try to superimpose this on a, a current aerial photograph, the things don't match up very well. But having said that, you can see that it says prairie on either side in the, in the vicinity, and then you'll see pine trees in other locations. Uh, so today, this is what we're looking at over to the west is the Deer Creek. Creek Preserve and Warm Mineral Springs. Um, 
you can see uh, Spring Haven and uh, curving down the Mayakahatchee Creek, Price Boulevard, um, and the spring itself. And so these blue lines uh, show the network of drainage features. Um, and that here they are superimposed on the old uh, 1948 aerial. So again, you can, it's sort of like connect the dots. They, they constructed the drainage system to connect the wetlands. So looking more closely um, at Little Salt Spring, you can see there, uh, I mentioned earlier, you can see in the lower left, those uh, parallel lines. So this was an agricultural operation of some sort, uh, row crops probably. Um, and uh, these persist even to this day. If you look at aerial imagery, you can still see some grooves over there uh, south of Glendale where the uh, ag took place. And so, what this points out is really minor um, changes in the topography can be very persistent. It doesn't take much of a change in topography to create a lasting effect on the landscape because things are so flat. So uh, as I said, you know, 70 years later, you can still see the uh, remains of the uh, ag operation there on the lower left. So this is the current situation. Um, Sarasota County owns that little turquoise patch, but the majority of the ownership there is uh, University of Miami owns the spring. There's some Sarasota school board property. And then uh, there's some undeveloped parcels between there and the creek. And then these are just some of the different uh, holding companies or developers that have those undeveloped plots. And it's my understanding that uh, there's an effort underway to try and make a connection between these two. Now, just uh, because we we're talking about springs, I wanted to include this, even though I'm not really focusing on warm mineral spring. So the overall trend, uh, this represents the discharge in cubic feet per second uh, from warm mineral springs. And um, the overall trend from the 40s has been downward, which is alarming. Uh, if you see some of the uh, dots, um, you know, it's down in the five or six cubic feet per second. So if you think about it, if, you're, if you have six cubic feet per second flowing out of the spring, that would be equivalent to uh, 12 people with half gallon balers bailing water once a second. So it's not a lot of water. It's pretty close to no water. But uh, the good news is recently, um, at least when this graph was made, things seemed to be looking up. There were some higher values. Uh, the, some of the efforts to um, in the Southern Water Use Caution Area may be having an effect. So hopefully the, the flows will increase again. Jono, we yes. had a, a question come through and I'm sorry to interrupt you on this. No topic. problem, we're, we're way ahead on time. So we have plenty of time for questions, go ahead. I, I, yeah, I've, I'm writing some notes here because there's some things that I kind of want to connect before we end this um, meeting. Sure. There's, this is fascinating what you're saying. Um, a question came up about seeing Little Salt Spring now and, and I didn't know it was owned by the University of Miami. <laughs> So yes. is there a way for the general public to get on that property now? No, there's not a way for the general public to get on the property. Uh, unfortunately, there was an effort a number of years ago, but not that many years ago. Uh, there was a possibility it might be uh, purchased or acquired by Sarasota County. And Sarasota County bobbled that transaction. Uh, I think they offended the university somehow. And so that didn't take place. Um, so it's a tremendous resource and, uh, you know, it's a biological, interesting biologically, archeologically, uh, both, you know, human remains and, um, uh, you know, place to see animals and that sort of stuff. It's similar to warm mineral springs in that regard. It's a very valuable site and I, we don't know what the fate of it's going to be. It obviously needs to be protected, and it also can't tolerate 
uh, a lot of use. So, uh, but no, it's not open to the public. Okay, thank you for answering that. Was there, were there other questions that were building up? Not yet, no. I've, okay. I've kind of been interjecting as they come in. And just for everybody that's listening, please feel free to ask questions. The, the chat box is down. If you hover over the bottom bar, it should pop up and it it's, looks like a little conversation bubble. So please feel free to ask questions as we go on. Thanks, Jono. Yeah, because I, there isn't that much more to the presentation. So we'll, we'll have plenty of time to chat afterwards. Um, so where was I? That was South Spring. You were talking about the um, aquifer. Yeah, so now I'm gonna go to Nona Spring. And what I wanted to do here was to help people understand how they can access some of this information on their own if they don't already know how to do this. So one great resource is the Sarasota County Property Appraiser. Um, it's just sc-pa.com, but you can just search for Sarasota County Property Appraiser. And if you go to the search menu, uh, and then scroll downward, you can go to map property search. So if you know that if you're looking for a particular parcel and you know the owner's name or the uh, PID, you can put that in and up, up above. But if you just want to look at the maps, you go down to this map property search and click on it. And then it will bring up uh, contemporary aerial photographs of, of the county. And you can scroll around left, right, up and down and get to areas you might be interested in. So here we see Nona Spring and uh, uh, over on the right, you see this little layer box. And you can go to the layers and there, there are many layers that you can turn on and off. So right now we're just looking at an aerial photograph, but if you check the parcel box here, then uh, it will superimpose in this golden tone uh, the various parcels. And you can click on any one of those to see who owns it and when they acquired it and how much taxes they're paying on it, what their, if their mailing address is the same as their street address and all that good stuff. Uh, but if you scroll down in those operational layers, you get to a list of aerial imagery. So um, if you go to the 19... 48 imagery and circle that, that brings up the oldest imagery that's in the database. So here we can see uh, uh, sort of a hammock to the north, uh, a slough, grassy wetland flowing in into the um, Nona. And then you can see a pretty straight line leading away. So that had also already been channelized uh, in 1948. But then if you, if you sort of go up the ladder and uh, click as you go up, you get to see uh, changes. So here it is in the middle of uh, transformation, well, just after they'd put in the canals and road system. And you can see how heavily impacted the area was as a result of uh, the uh, construction. And so you can just keep clicking through time and do sort of your own time lapse, time travel, uh, looking at these various parts of the city. And so here again is the 2020 aerial imagery. And so um, this is a close up um, of, of section 33. Um, you can see somebody wrote 33 on the center of it. And I wanted to just start with a sort of rudimentary approach to uh, photo interpretation. Uh, so you can see that there was a water course, a vegetated water course, and these white lines are trails. I didn't draw them all in, but there were a number of trails and those would have been, um, it could have been cattle trails, but they're probably wider and probably for, uh, you know, depending on the year, Model A's or Model T's or other vehicles that went through. You'll see in the, on the uh, right over here, there's a lot of white sand. Now white sand in an aerial photograph can mean a number of things. It can be a disturbed area disturbed by people, uh, or it can be a disturbed area by a flood event. So if you have a high water flow that uh, washes white sand up out of a water course uh, into the surrounding landscape, that can give you a white signature as well. I don't know what happened here. Uh, I'd have to do more digging to try and figure out whether that's human activity or something else going on. Uh, if you look down in the bottom, you see that red line 
I'm going to erase it. But there's clearly a line there. Now, sometimes when you see a line on an aerial photograph, it's where two negatives were matched up. And so there's a discontinuity in the exposure. But this is a real line. It's not, a, it's not where two images were joined. And what I think may be going on there has to do with how land is uh, carved up. This is getting back to Jefferson. So if you look, this is a quarter section. So the whole section 33 was a square mile. This is a quarter mile. And you can see that that line is parallel to and reasonably close to the eastern boundary of that quarter section. So it's my guess that uh, whoever put that in thought they were along the uh, half section line. And then you'll see these um, ag areas. And if you look at the ag areas, you'll see that there's a straight line on the east side of uh, the, the one to the right. And that coincides with uh, the lower quarter of the first quarter. So again, probably some property ownership and that person had the right to put in a pasture or a field that went to that area. Now, if you really want to do aerial uh, photography analysis of um, historic aerials, you need to go to a place called PALMM and just put that in your search engine and it will bring up a, um, a bunch of uh, historic aerial imagery and you can select aerials. And these are incredible photographs. These are nine by nine inch negatives. They're tremendously huge negatives. And uh, so they contain a lot of detailed information. So if you look at the lower right, that's where um, Nona Spring is. So you see the spring there. And what we learned from this that we didn't get from the county is the context that there was a lot of ag happening down in Charlotte County. Uh, the county line is probably about in there somewhere. Now, why it drifted up into Sarasota, I don't know. But um, there was a lot of agriculture in 1948, looks like row crops of some sort in the um, vicinity of Nona Spring. And so here you can see Nona Spring and I've colored in that green is area that is pretty clearly uh, cabbage palm hammock. The area to the north would, was appeared to be a mix of live oak and cabbage palm, but the majority of the that area uh, lining the slough that led away from the spring with probably virtually all cabbage palms in there. So uh, this is it today, and you can see, uh, you know, individual cabbage palms. The, there's those circular little dots that that look like. Um, um, you know, jimmies on an ice cream cone. Those are the canopies of the cabbage palms and the other trees are mostly oaks. And then you can see there's a variety of shrubby stuff, probably Ludwigia and other uh, plants that have been invaded right around the uh, spring itself. And I think that's about all I had planned, yes. Um, so I'm happy to, we have plenty of time for questions. And um, again, I suspect that people online on the call uh, know more than I do about uh, environmental history, but I wanted to share the few things I've been able to piece together. Well, thank you, Dono. And it is really helpful to have it all in one place like that. And um, I, I learned a lot, so I really appreciate it. My big takeaway, though, is it's, it's just amazing how much has changed in such a short time. I mean, less than 100 years, it's changed completely. And, and 100 years is a blip in time. So it, it's really uh, striking, devastating actually to see to see how different it is. But more on that in a minute. We do have a couple of questions that came up and I knew you were kind of towards the end, so I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, one of the questions is, uh, do you know if there are any aerial photos earlier than 1948? In Northport? Yeah, there were some 1943 photos in, that you can find over closer to Arcadia, but I don't think they get as, this far west. There are rumors, um, I've heard rumors that the federal government took aerial photographs from balloons in the 20s, um, but they are, you know, according to legend, they're in the archives in Washington, uh, you know stored next to the Ark of the Covenant <laughs> in some box somewhere. So I don't know how easy they are to find, but no, uh, 
it's hard to find anything prior to 1940 as an aerial image. At least I haven't been able to. Okay. And I just, I think all of this should be in our, our school curriculum for the schools in Northport. I mean, I'm a teacher, I, I don't teach um, social studies, but I, I think it's really important for kids, especially, you know, locally like this to understand where they're living and, and the history of the area. So from a land standpoint and the ecosystems, it's really important, so. Um, let's see, uh, another question related to Big Slough, uh, the a similar question from earlier, do you know if it was dredged? Yes, yes, that, that's the point. The, the um, let's see if we can, if there's a, I, don't know I guess the question a... is specific to the 1920s. Do you know for certain it was dredged on Big Slough Preserve in the 1920s is, is more specific. Yes, yes, question. yes. So uh, go back further here. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, I'm hoping no one has a seizure, but I'm trying to get back to the <laughs> section. Uh, Michael Brothers. Um, and just as a side note, people enjoyed your Jimmy's on an ice cream cone comment. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so let's go back to the to this um, Sugar Bowl drainage district. Uh, this is from 1927. Okay, um, and it says it existed in 1927. And so here is the upper part of the district on the right. You can see the the slough is running through there and it's and you can see it's labeled canal right under the word drainage and drainage district it says canal main canal it says and then so then we have the uh, blue dashed line that represents well I should go back hold on so that blue dashed line is the northern boundary of Northport so you can see that main canal is clearly marked in in this drawing And then at some point it turns in, it, it's not channelized. So you have this sort of old traditional meanders or wiggles in the, in the slough. But um, we know from the aerial photograph, um, and when, where did we see that? Where did we see the aerial? Nope. Uh, we know from the aerial photograph that it was channelized in 1940 because you can see the, uh, in 48 or whatever, you can see the, the, um, the ditch running down the center of it. So that was back, that was back where we were talking about. So you can, in fact, here you can see, um, before that blue line goes through there, you can see that there was a dotted line where it was ditched in 48. So yes, the, uh, it, I don't know how far south it was ditched. I don't know where it switched from ditching to them just relying on the natural channel. But it, it had probably been ditched for at least 20 and maybe more years at that point. All right, um, let's see. There were some questions about artifacts. Uh, let me find that question again here. Has there been any effort to inventory the relics that are located in this area or oh boy. is that committed to the three springs? Well, you know, Steve Kosky could help you with that question. Um, he, there were, there's a lot of material that's come out of both Little Salt Spring, Warm Mineral Springs, Nona Spring. Uh, then they're just random, you know, inappropriate illegal pot hunting. And then there have been a number of situations where uh, people working on drainage uh, or other construction issues for Northport have inadvertently destroyed um, sites that were either, uh, you know, contained bones or artifacts. But, uh, you know, Steve Kosky is very familiar with uh, Little Salt Spring and he works now uh, for the county, I believe, half time. So if you contact County Historic, Sarasota County Historical Resources, I think you can get in touch with him and he can tell you uh, the extent to which that stuff has been 
cataloged. All right, thank you. There's there was a question about the streets that seem to go nowhere. So roads to nowhere, northwest of 75. Northwest of, huh. Um, I, I guess I don't know what they're referring to. Um, uh, northwest of 75. Uh, I suppose we could go to, um, let's see, I don't know. I guess I don't know where the where people are talking about, and I don't I don't have a lot of current imagery on here. Um, so I don't know if I can be very helpful on that. Okay. Um, another question: you, you showed a picture of some row crops. What types of crops were being produced? Um, that, so that map, the the the. Uh, uh, let's see, these maps, um, if you take time and look at some of these, uh, so like in here it says sawgrass, artesian well, Hollingsworth cow house, um, a small house about one and a quarter acres under fence, dipping that hammock down here. Let's go to the next one. This says Long Lake, Artesian Well. Um, dipping that about 10 acres under cultivation. I've seen some annotations elsewhere, maybe further down. Uh, Artesian Well and Camp. No, I, I Whatever I saw the listing of the crops, I don't, I, I can't help you. Don't know exactly what they're growing. Here's a question about the springs um, and, and kind of related to all of the new development that's going on. Are the springs at risk of drying up? Well, uh, yes, I would say they are. So there was a very famous recreational destination on the Peace River called Kissingen Spring. And Kissingen Spring was a pretty important spring. They had a big bathhouse and you know a diving board, and they would hold dances there. It was quite the place to go. It would have been comparable to, um, you know, Silver Spring or some of the springs further north uh, in the state. And then um, the phosphate industry was pumping so much water from the aquifer that the spring derived from that the groundwater relationship reversed. And instead of water flowing out of the spring into the Peace River, water started flowing out of the Peace River into the spring and sort of running you know, down a hole, a, a sinkhole. And so they put up a sill or a barrier to keep the river from disappearing. Um, and Julie and I have canoed down the Peace River and, and gotten out of our canoe and walked across the floodplain to where a sinkhole had formed. And you could look down and see the canopies of trees down at the bottom of this sinkhole. And there was a, um, a sort of a stream or rivulet. You could see when the river came up and left its banks that water started flowing uh, towards this sinkhole and you know would have been disappearing down it. So we know historically that areas that were discharging uh, south of Tampa Bay, um, discharging springs uh, stopped flowing. And it's possible that Deep Hole in the Lower Mayaka Lake at one point uh, was connected to an aquifer that was discharging, but it, it doesn't at the moment. Um, and because of that decline in the flow at Warm Mineral Spring, uh, there is a risk and, and both Nona and Salt Little Salt Spring have never been at, well, at least in recent years, haven't had any significant flow. They flow, but I don't, it's not impressive, I would say. So uh, yes, if, if trends had continued, there would have been a risk that a warm mineral spring would stop flowing uh, and just become a, a sinkhole lake which obviously would be devastating for the recreational aspect. Um, so uh, it's important to, to try to find ways 
to you know do whatever can be done to try to guarantee that the aquifers that are contributing to our mineral spring and the others are not unduly uh, reduced. And that's hard to do because the vast majority of legislation that is related to water quality deals with potable water. So if you think about the Piney Point situation uh, on Tampa Bay, the, the solution at the tiny, tiny point is to pump the water down into an aquifer that people don't use. Well, what they mean is don't use for drinking water. But um, these deep aquifers are heavily mineralized and are warm, which is a description of the water flowing out of warm mineral springs. So um, we don't know enough uh, to know what areas, you know, what kind of uh, hydrologic alterations change the flow to warm mineral springs. There's apparently several different aquifers that contribute water. It's not just all coming from one strata. Um, so when you, when you try to start protecting these areas, you find that most of the legislation dealing with water protection focuses on potable water and people haven't given a lot of thought to protecting a heavily mineralized warm water source that's really quite unusual. In fact, um, there are many um, maps of the Springs region of Florida that don't include the springs here in Sarasota County. They seem to believe they stop around Sulphur Springs or Lithia Springs uh, and that there aren't any springs further south. And so this, the first magnitude, the, the springs to the north, the Wikiwachis and the Crystal Rivers uh, mm -hmm. get a lot of airplay. Uh, if they were to decline by six cubic feet per second, most people wouldn't notice. But as I pointed out earlier, there've been times where, where mineral springs declined by six cubic feet per second, it would stop flowing. So yeah, it's, it's a little precarious and I believe um, the Northport Commission is working on a strategy to try and encourage their, um, to try and make a priority for their legislative priorities in the coming year to see if they can't get some uh, support from Tallahassee to better understand or better protect the springs in the city. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Obviously, water is one of the most important topics we can be talking about, and it's it's very um, important that people keep learning about water and, and ways to protect water. Um, there's another question here. Uh, is it so is it your opinion that excuse me, I need to go back up. Um, much of the scrubby flatwoods habitat in Northport is due to spoil from road building and low water levels due to digging canals? Oof. Um, my, my instinct would be to say no. I think if you look at uh, Oscar Shear and many of the scrubby flatwood sites, a lot of them tend to be adjacent to uh, creeks. And so, um, and I showed you earlier the, the graphic of the, um, the scrubby flatwoods uh, in Northport. So let me see. Um, well, um, I'll just talk about it. The, um, I think what happens, one of the ways scrubby flatwoods get created is that uh, just as I talked about before, sometimes when you see a lot of white sand, it's the result of a, a flood event. And so if you imagine a creek that's a modest little creek, and then you have, say, a tropical depression that's completely saturated the landscape with water, and then a hurricane comes through a week later, you could have a massive flood coming down what is normally a very modest stream course. And um, because their soils are so sandy, the velocity of that, uh, of, of that much additional water will pick the sand up, and it'll leave the the channel, but as soon as the water leaves the channel, the velocity drops because the cross section is a lot wider. And um, when the velocity drops, some of that sand comes out of suspension. And so what happens is you'll have what's called a natural levee. You'll have an area immediately adjacent to uh, a water course where uh, the sand is actually deeper. And because it's next to a water course, and this is a little counterintuitive, because it's next to a watercourse and it's sand, it ends up being drier. And that's because uh, 
rain that falls on the water table goes straight down and then immediately moves laterally into the stream course. So what you end up with is a higher, drier soil that's immediately next to a wetland system. And so you see that at Oscar Shearer, you see it along um, uh, Myakahatchee, uh, and I think you see it elsewhere. It's possible that some soil disturbance in Northport uh, did create elevated conditions that may have been colonized by uh, you know, our, our scrub oaks. Um, and so I wouldn't rule that out, but in general, I think this, the scrubby flatwoods areas are naturally occurring and are, are most pronounced uh, in the vicinity of, of creeks that may have had the, you know, we talk about the 100 year storm. Well, there's also a 500 year storm and a 2000 year storm. And eventually you, you're talking about moving a lot of sand around. So there are some, uh, there's some conversation going about dipping vats. Yes. You want to? Talk about those at all? Yes, sure. So you can see see that see this mustard pillar here. That those are uh, scrubby flatwoods that were adjacent to um, uh, Big Slough, and then this was dry prairie in here. And the fact that they were uh, put this in cultivation meant that that was probably a drier site. So all of this would have been drier. So the dipping vats. Let's um, let's see if we can get to the dipping vats. So um, there was a big problem. There have been a number of uh, issues for a while. In fact, Florida was a big sheep producing. Uh, it, there were a lot of sheep in Florida, which I didn't know, but that didn't work out. But cattle have been here since the Spanish came. And um, they had a problem, I believe, with ticks. And I, I suspect ticks that were uh, carrying disease. And so um, they, um, they would create these dipping vets, which were troughs, and they would force the cattle to um, wade through these vats. Uh, they, you know, they'd herd them up and make them wade through there. And I believe the primary component that was killing the ticks was arsenic. So as a result, uh, there were these vats all over the landscape. And um, they're, you know, basically toxic because of the arsenic concentration. They're basically uh, ar arsenic um, problems. And so, when people buy land, whether it's the county or um, private individuals, th th there's an effort to try and uh, be careful that they're not um, not buying dipping vets that are going to be a real problem in terms of how they can develop the land. Okay, there was a question. They said they understood about the aerial um, footage, but is there a way to view old survey maps? A, an easy yes. go to source? It is, it, there is a way to view old survey maps, and it is complicated. <laughs> It takes some getting used to, um, and uh, I think I think the way you find it is Labins L A B I N S. So if you go, let me just check on Google here on my phone, Florida Labins L A B I N S. Yes, DEP, the Division of State Lands Bureau of Survey and Mapping about Labins. So um, that's where these old historic uh, land records are, but it, it really takes a while to get used to figure out how to navigate, how to find these survey records and the, and the descriptions. And then as I think I demonstrated, the handwriting of these guys may have been like great penmanship at the time, but we're just not used to reading some of that script. And so trying to decipher what, you know, you picture some guy and it's, you know, it's 95 degrees that are mosquitoes and he's trying to, you know, make some minimal useful recordings about what he's walking through. So uh, it, it can be a challenge, but yes, go to um, Florida L-A-B-I-N-S and, and look for the uh, land survey records. And they have information there that attempts to teach you how to find everything. But, um, 
if you're really interested, it would be good to find an old uh, surveyor or someone that's been working with them that can sort of show you the ropes because it's not as transparent and easy as you might hope. But they are a great source. They're, they're really the sort of first, uh, the three things are the old aerial photographs, the soil surveys, and these old surveyor's notes. Um, th those three sort of can triangulate your way into figuring out what a given piece of uh, land might have been like a hundred or more years ago. Yeah, this, this has been fascinating. We bought our house and it was built in 1957. So as you were going through the maps and talking about the history of Northport, we're, we're in Venice, not Northport, but I, I like to think about what this area was like back when our house was just built. And uh, it, it's just, everything has changed so much in just a, a short time. That's why I'm such a big fan of these uh, conservation organizations and, and organizations that are buying up land to protect the land and um, also just private conservation. We bought a little quarter acre lot in Charlotte County just so, to keep it from being bulldozed. So it's it's got beautiful oaks and uh, pine trees on it. And so it, it's just, it's important because once all this is gone, it's gone. So I, I appreciate the the overview tonight and just kind of sharing for those that are in Northport what the area was like and and how much it's changed in a short time. Um, I don't, there's a couple more questions. Well, just one more here. Uh, can you remind us of the source for the old aerial photos again? What was the abbreviation? It's Palm with two M's, P-A-L-M-M. P-A-L. M M. So let me just go to let me just type that into my phone to make sure this is going to work for everybody. Uh, I'm going to put in Florida. P A L M M. Yes, the Florida Virtual Campus. It's the Florida Heritage Collection. I still don't know why it's called Palm with two M's, but. Um, when you get there, they have all sorts of resources and one is uh, historic aerial photographs. Okay, I just typed that in the chat box. I'm, I'm hoping that people are able to see the chat box. I know some people are because they're typing questions, but I did put, uh, I put what you shared in there. I also put some information in there about the Environmental Conservancy of Northport because they're the ones that are hosting this, your presentation this evening. And um, they're just such a wonderful organization buying up land to protect it. And that's all because of the support of the community. So that's, that's really, really important. Um, right, so Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to remind people that on June 30th, I'm gonna be doing another presentation based on my book, which is called The Palmetto Book. And it's an introduction to cabbage palms. So if you're interested in both the natural and cultural history of our state tree, um, you should look for that. Jono, what's the easiest way for people to buy your book if they're interested? Well, what I recommend is going to your favorite local independent bookseller. I don't know what that would be in Northport. Uh, if you don't have one, you can always go to Amazon. They'd be happy to sell you one. All right, so that was June 30th for the next presentation. And again, just for everybody that's watching, this one is being recorded right now. And once we edit it and get it uploaded to YouTube, it's going to be available via the Environmental Conservancy of Northport's website. And I did put that in the chat box, but it is www.ecnorthport.com. And the link to the YouTube channel is on their website. And this video, uh, this presentation tonight will, will be out there. Well, and Samantha, uh, let me just say, if yeah. people want to reach me, if they, if they either have information about the environmental history they want to share or um, want to get in touch with me, uh, the simplest way is just cabbagepalm at gmail.com. It's pretty easy to remember. At gmail.com, I'm typing that yep. in. Okay. Yep. And uh, that'll get to me. And uh, I, as I say, you know, I don't live anywhere near nor Northport. I live be close. I can walk to the uh, Sarasota Bradenton Airport in 20 minutes. But uh, because of those two reports I was involved in, I've, I've had a longstanding interest in Northport and what's going on down there. And um, I'm always interested in learning more about it. 
All right. It seems like everybody really enjoyed your presentation. And um, again, I, I know some of it was a little quick. There, there was a lot of information in a short time, but it is being recorded. So we will upload it to YouTube. And that way, for those of you that want to watch it again, you can pause it and rewind it and, and watch it at your leisure. So you can watch it at your own pace. Um, we just thank you everyone for tuning in. And this the wonderful thing about technology is we can all be here learning together in the comfort of our own home. So it, it's that's a good thing. But we'll see everyone again on June 30th. It's going to be the next presentation with John O. Miller. And it's also going to be hosted by the same nonprofit, the Environmental Conservancy of Northport. So thanks for tuning in. And hopefully everyone has a wonderful night. Thank you so much, Jono, for being our presenter. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Samantha. All right, thank you.